Bev, we came to you a year ago about this time uh, to talk to you about the research that you were doing, tracking the trackers mm. at Facebook. Now we've had Cambridge Analytica, we've had the Facebook scandal, we've had a fall of nearly $100 <laughs> billion. Yeah. How do you feel about the fallout? How have you felt about seeing all that news come out about the things that you were looking at? Well, vindicated, because <laughs> lots of people um, describe me as a paranoid conspiracy theorist. Really? When I would, I went to the Ministry of Justice and gave them a, um, a demonstration of our research, and a lot of people just didn't believe me. I think they really thought uh, I was making it up, which was not the case, because obviously we had, you know, years worth of research tracking the trackers on people's browsers. So. We had a huge amount of data that it was incontestable in terms of what was happening. Um, but I think there was something between the research evidence and people's imaginations, and the gap was just too large for them to understand what was really going on. So what was amazing is that the following day after, after doing that presentation, the Cambridge Analytica thing began to break. Now, I'd been following that amazing journalist, Caroline, um, uh, who began the story a year ago when she was studying Brexit. And I thought, this is incredible, because you could see that it was the Facebook data that had been used. And because we'd had an ethical dilemma when we realised how much data we'd managed to access, we then stopped our data collection and contacted all our respondents and said, we've got this data on you. Um, we're very happy to delete it all. Um, can we go ahead or not? And we asked for permission and we didn't even go into people's friendships. We just collected their use. And we thought at that time, this is incredible. If you can get this amount of data, which we thought we were just getting data on the Facebook platform and we were getting data on total browser use. So we knew then that there was something going on and it was just the two of us. <laughs> and imagine if you had a huge research team like Kogan had working on this data, computer scientists full time. We thought you could do a hell of a lot and they did. Let's talk about some of the things that you found out and that perhaps uh, people wouldn't like to believe about Facebook because yeah. their at actual attitude in terms of how the ways in which they've scraped up this data. I mean, last time you talked about how they lied about being able to track people offline. Yeah. Yeah. Can we talk about how some of the other things that they've broken, the things that, um, how do you think they've managed to keep that trust while clearly all the time, I mean, recently there was the biometric stuff. So mm. Facebook said, you can't stop us taking your biometric yeah. data. And then on the other side, you have Mark Zuckerberg saying, I care about community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, how, yeah. so kind of their actual attitude in terms of pushing through on how much data they can collect. Can you talk a bit more about how they've possibly broken rules that we didn't know were there? Well, in, in the first place, they I think most um, digital companies, the big ones, the big monopolies, as they are, um, work on the basis of take us on legally. It's a very different approach to legality. It's like take us on if you dare. Google, Google has hundreds of cases going on all, all the time. And basically, you have to have the money, the technology, and the, the power, basically, to take them on. So I think they don't really care. Uh, I think they basically think nobody can get to us and that's how they just, I mean, they are, they are just like the old robber barons, the monopolistic robber barons who just did whatever they wanted. And then maybe they'd introduce some safety regulations <laughs> after they killed a few hundred people. So I think it's in that mode that they're so big, they're so powerful. Governments depend on them for their surveillance. So they are kind of a, an office of the state in many respects, particularly in the UK and in the US, that they just really, really don't care. So I do think, I do think, and I'm not sure anymore, I did think Mark Zuckerberg really wanted to run for president. And so we saw him giving that data to the Stanford University computer scientists and economist people. And I thought that was to kind of map all the profiles of the US population. So therefore, he could work out in a more sophisticated way than even Obama did and Steve Bannon did how to target populations. So I still believe he really wanted to run for president. 
And I think all those vacuous speeches about community and caring and making things free for the world when basically they just want everybody's data um, was part of that political ambition. Um, I might be being cynical. Some people say that a lot of Silicon Valley people really do want to uh, do good things. But if they really wanted to do good things, they'd actually control the monopolistic intervention into people's lives in the most phenomenal way that we've ever seen. So it's kind of a very different form of caring to the one I would expect. What do you think about the fact that Mark Zuckerberg has refused to meet the DCMS, the Select Committee? I know. I know. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, that didn't surprise me at all. Because why would he? It's a small country. Um, it doesn't really matter. We're not He's, that important. No, to him. exactly, exactly. And we are the most deregulated data country, more than the US even. So yeah. basically, they've got access to everything they want here. Um, so why should he bother? He doesn't need to persuade this government to kind of work for him. He's got everything he needs. And it. He's working again. It's like, take us on if you can. We don't care. They are monopoly com companies. So the data brokers in the US refuse to appear before the Senate. Um, and they've got a lot of, in the US, they've got a lot of representation uh, with power. I mean, Peter Thiel, Facebook founder, mm -hmm. Donald Trump's tech uh, advisor. So they've got a huge amount of uh, investment, uh, lobbying in government. Um, they've paid the HMRC significant amounts of money to advertise, so they don't pay tax. We know all about their tax dodging. So I think really, that why would they bother? Why would he take a transatlantic plane flight to turn up for something when he doesn't really care? When I was reading the FT a few months ago, I was seeing how, I mean, and you just talked about Mark Zuckerberg's mm. presidency. There's a lot of business press mm. that are very sycophantic about yeah. these tech guys. You saw that with some of the articles about Zuckerberg's yeah. presidency, but you also see it in the kind of um, wonder that they hold these yeah. companies in, yeah. uh, such as Amazon, such as Facebook, and the mm. GAFAM family, and all of those things. Do you think, uh, in that FT article, I saw them kind of um, suggesting that all these companies were getting away with no regulations at the moment. Mm. Do you think that bubble has burst now? Uh, <clears throat> one would hope so. <laughs> But, again, anybody who's regulating them has to have the knowledge and the capacity. And um, what we know from Snowden, what we know from WikiLeaks, is that there is nobody really controlling them and there's not that many people who have the technical capacity to control them. So there's a lot of legal uh, data specialists in the US, but they can't keep pace because law takes a long time. Law is very deliberative, and you can basically hold things up for an awful long while if you need to. Um, so I would argue for regulation. You've got to have a start. You've got to have something. But whether it will be effective, for me, the only thing would be to break down the monopolies, to actually break them up into <laughs> their small bits and, and basically stop monopolistic trading of people's data. So who's in charge, whose responsibility is it in the UK at the moment to, um, to regulate them or to monitor them? Well, I, I, <laughs> it's very, very dispersed. There isn't really any control over them as far as I can see from where I've been looking. Um, I haven't investigated the legal controls in the UK. Um, but I, I suspect there's very little interest. I mean, I've been astonished at how little political parties actually know about how they operate. So I was looking at kind of Labour's um, digital policy and I, I was just saddened by their lack of knowledge, really. Um, so I think you would need people with a huge amount of... Um, ability to regulate. And I mean, the huge problem with the government is they're using massive amounts of software. You know, there's a great point made by Mozarov, which is the government uses private insurance companies to investigate um, data, sorry, it uses uh, private data surveillance companies to investigate private data frauds. So, you know, the fraud office would be the obvious place to look, but who do they rely on to provide the, the data, to provide the evidence? So there's a huge problem, really, really huge problem. I mean, I'm hoping 
that people will become more aware. And a lot of people have actually stopped, done delete Facebook. Mm -hmm. I think it's 74,000 when I last looked. Now that's an action. That's a significant, it's not that many if you think about the billions, yeah. but it's a significant action because people have to deliberately do that. So I think it's quite important that we see that people are doing something. Because in our research, when we interviewed everybody after we collected all the data and we interviewed them about it, most people talked about a contract with the devil. They talked about it as, it was, the language was extraordinary, as a, um, a necessity, an evil necessity. Um, um, and it was always about, they were trapped. But I called it an ideology of convenience because it was an ideology that made people do things or not do things. And so what happened is most people thought, oh, well, I can't be bothered um, and I need this. And so they just didn't do anything. So it's kind of an ideology of inaction where people just go, oh, I'll accept this. So the fact that people have done something says to me that there is probably some political disenchantment and a hundred... Uh, 100 billion, is it, that they lost off their stocks yeah, yeah. is really significant. It is. Really significant. So, you know, that's good. I mean, Joseph Chiro, in his books, he talked a lot about resignation, that people weren't yeah. active participants yeah. in their data being given away. Yeah. They were just in a, a state of resignation because there was yeah. nothing yeah. they could do and they yeah. didn't really know how things yeah. were being used. You said you think it should be broken up. Yeah. Other people have suggested nationalisation. Yeah. Um, potentially, maybe coming up with... Uh, a digital EPA, a, yeah. a protection agency, yeah. some kind of regulator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you still think that breaking them up is their best idea? And what do you think of those? I think you need ideas? all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you nationalise the bits after you've broken them up. Uh, you regulate the bits after you've broken them up. Because there are, that's, that's why the legal thing's so difficult, because there are lots of different... There's, like, the fraud, um, there's the surveillance, there's, the, there's all sorts of aspects that they work on that need breaking up and each part should be regulated and of course people should have data protection but this is not really about individuals I think this is about corporate surveillance added to state surveillance both of them working almost hand in hand which we've never seen before you know, there used to be debates about what was the difference between state surveillance and, uh, you know, controls at work. But now we're seeing this incredible intermeshing of interests and it just has to be taken apart. Do you think we have a problem with talking about regulation in this country? Because I still haven't seen that kind of mention, that yeah. push to the fore, even though we've had this big fallout that started, you know, with, with uh, Carol in the UK... There's no, mm -hmm. no one saying we need rules on these companies, yeah. we need regulations. Is that because we're a deregulated country that, that the corporates have got away yeah. with doing it for so long? Yeah, and I, I do think it's almost, again, there's... Um, it's like the, the ancient historical tradition of free trade, which began with slavery, is still being reproduced all the time, that people should be free to operate, where, in fact, it means free to totally control other people's lives. So, yes, I do think we've had deregulation has almost become common sense, and I think we really need to reinstitute it. But then I think a lot of people just think regulation, how, how will we ever achieve it? So there's a bit of a, a fatalism around how it is even possible. And I think that's that's the issue. But we have to. I mean, I, I really would strongly argue that, you know, there's so many things need re-regulating. Um, and it's we always know regulation is just a start, but you've got to have it in place before you can build on it. We've got, we've, well, GDPR is coming in in May. Yeah. We potentially, obviously, leaving <laughs> the EU <laughs> at this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Might not be party to that, yeah. but it seems like a really, really important... Yeah. Um, legislation definitely again I've seen um, the way that they've talked about China as we've seen the rise of the data giants in China yeah. obviously they've got the social credit system um, I've seen kind of reports saying that Amazon is handicapped because they're not able to scrape data like China is and they're going to come up against yeah. GDPR do you think it's a uh, going to be an important piece of legislation I think it's really important I think the fact they've got this far is incredible and the people I've spoken to in Europe who are involved in it are very, very optimistic. But Brexit 
<laughs> so, so, you know, we're in the country that's given most of its citizens' data away. Uh, we're in the country that has less regulation than any other. And now we've got Brexit. So I'm not that hopeful. But I would, would really like a much, much more robust version of it to be introduced in the UK. Just as a last point kind of in this section, you were talking about the meshing of these interests. Mm. I feel like it's important that we should mention Peter Thiel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. Uh, recently yeah. Bloomberg reported that he's that Palantir is moving into Europe more. Yeah. We have a, a government yeah. that's already yeah. reliant on Palantir's services. Um, in the US he was Trump's kind yeah. of high profile Silicon mm. Valley supporter mm -hmm. and he wanted to build the system that would exclude, well not exclude, that would um, perform the operations for like stuff like the Muslim yeah. ban exactly. or any immigration checks yeah, and exactly. so on. I just wanted to talk about how potentially these companies and people like Peter Thiel, how they will have an effect on uh, inequality and immigration. Um, at the moment the immigration bill, there's an exclusion which allows the mm -hmm. government to track immigrants yeah. far more than any other group. Yeah. Do you think that's going to be extended to other groups? Oh, and sure, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how that technology will be used to exclude yeah. people? Yeah. Oh, well, the, the developments of um, screening for immigration control is already one of the most developed forms of technology we have. So uh, the implications for inequality with this new technology are phenomenal um, because everybody's being tracked but they're being tracked very, very differently. Um, and so high net worth individuals, for instance, are being tracked for their spending or to sell them services that can make their lives easier. Mm. Um, low net worth individuals, as they're called, are being tracked to be sold debt, to enable them to survive, to um, catch them out if they are doing anything remotely dodgy uh, for predictive policing, for forms of state surveillance. You know, the, the, the amount of surveillance on more vulnerable populations is extraordinary. Now, if you imagine you add that to an increasingly vulnerable migrant population, um, the way they're going to be moving around the country through various forms of strange predictive policing that are being introduced ad hoc into various different police systems. Um, but then through all the government networks is going to be, I think, quite profound. So those are the groups who are going to be targeted much more by state surveillance than by corporate surveillance. Um, and I think we'll see how that develops. But I mean, Peter Thiel was always interested in um, selling security surveillance to the government. I mean, the original Palantir was working with Middle Eastern data. Um, so he's been developing this for some time. And the fact that he wants to move into Europe suggests to me he'll just sell a, a billion dollar deal to track migrants of any kind. And because he has a lot of that historic data from the Middle East, they'll be tracked right from the start. So I think it's very, yeah, very, very worrying. And I think the more vulnerable a population, the more they're going to be subject to state surveillance. And the high net worth uh, populations are going to be subject to corporate surveillance much more. So I think that's where we'll see the differences emerging in the technology. But I also think we need to add in Steve Bannon into this, you know, because he is a Peter Thiel, um, you know, Palantir, providing security services for the state and Donald Trump. Um, you know, absolutely far-right libertarian who, you know, didn't believe women should have the vote, so we know what sort of person he is. Steve Bannon, similarly, alt-right, far-right, um, you know, happens to be able to use uh, Christopher Wiley as a gay boy because he thinks it'll open new markets for him, but basically if you track all of his political activities, they are horrifically racist. They, he's now moved into Italy and into France and is offering his supercomputer support to um, the fascist parties. So, you know, we've got these people are moving, obviously, in any monopoly uh, drive, are moving into every form of surveillance they possibly can and are moving into any area, geopolitical area they can. But because they carry the history of surveillance, testing, experimentation, data, effectivity, they're going to be incredibly powerful and they're the people we should be watching, I think. And 
I mean, with the SCL stuff and the links to Cambridge Analytica, there's also been this uncovering, I think, for the first time in the public eye of the military background of exactly. Silicon Valley and, yeah. you know, all these psyops yeah. and things. So yeah. this feeling that that would be merging with yeah. these figures yeah. and that much power, yeah. you know, hopefully is a call to action for people. <laughs> well, it should be a call to action, <laughs> but you almost think, what would it take mm. for people to be called to action. Now, clearly, they're making a, a small step by deleting Facebook, and I know quite a few people have done that, and I think, you know, great. But the fact that the same people are also welcoming the preemptive devices into their homes, the Alexas and the, the, the Internet of Things, into their homes to watch them, to listen to them, to kind of collect every single piece of data on them in their intimate environment, it's kind of when are they going to be called to action?